First things first to mention is this news I saw courtesy of Cracked.com. The headline is Joe Rogan is no longer in love with being the uncancellable comedy don. Obviously, the headlines a bit is a bit clickbaity, but essentially it's Joe Rogan complaining that running a club isn't what it all cracked up to be, like the day to day of running it, which is you know self evident. But also, I'd imagine the stress of having all these fucking leeches or flipping comedians who just want to use you for your clout and your fame you know coming around you for they want to get flipping slots at a club that's got to be really exhausting i think i said it before in the podcast i wonder what's more exhausting for joe like what's more what gives him more of a headache day to day having comedians you know try and like suck up to him to get on the podcast or having comedians you know bug him to get a set at the comedy club like what's got to be more of a headache day to day because I think the podcast is definitely more of a headache because the podcast covers, you know, a whole range of people. It's not only comedians. Um, everyone wants to get on there because whatever they're selling, whether it's a book, a supplement, opening a new hotel, it's going to do bits. So I wonder which one is more annoying day to day. Obviously, if you've got but as, as Richie said, if you've got both, it's horrible, right? If you're running a club and you've got one of the, you know, the, the world's most successful podcasts, it's going to be a nightmare to deal with, especially if you're managing both of the things. I think if Rogan kind of like was outsourcing a lot of the booking of the podcast, maybe he could kind of, you know, blame somebody else. Same thing with the comedy club, but I think now he's starting to tell people, oh, this Adam Eager guy is the one that's in charge. I think he's been saying that. I think from what I remember, kind of like, you know, reading between the lines, it sounds like he's starting to like palm off a lot of responsibilities, you know, to people he doesn't want to play to Adam Eager. And the ones he wants, he gives him a personal call. So with Joe, it's pretty obvious if you're going to get booked there, you get a personal call. Usually, I'd imagine, especially if you're friends, you get a personal call from him. He picks up, hey, it's Joe, whatever, huh? whatever that fucking accent is, right? Um, dude, I'd like you to come to my club. Anyway, let's read the article. It says, the king of anti-cancel culture comedy opened up um, the comedy membership in Austin, Texas early this year. A club where comedians can perform unfiltered, untweetable sets with the safety of knowing that their audience is unafraid, unvaccinated and unarmed. <laughs> unvaccinated. Slipping this one in there. Though vaccination cards are not the needed to be gained into a comedy club, metal detectors are used to enforce the no firearms policy. Phones are confiscated upon admittance and an audience members are subjected to compulsory face scans before they are seated. All of this stuff probably worries them more than the lack of flipping. Um, whoever's writing for Cracked is definitely one of those people that goes to the goes to the fucking supermarket now and still wears a face mask. They're more annoyed that Joe Rogan doesn't have mandatory flipping vaccination card entry policy as opposed to him making sure that no one gets shot up inside there. <laughs> that seems to be more of the fucking thing that's getting a bee under their bonnet. I just saw flipping Taylor Lorenz now actually posted a clip on her flipping, I think on tit on tw Twitter, talking about um what she's talking about. Talking about how she's doing I don't know, she got I think she got some article out on the Rolling Stones and she's walking around in shops in LA wearing a face mask. Like I'm just like, Taylor Lorenz, give it up, brother, man. She's got a face like she's a 60 and a body like she's flipping 21. It's absolutely bizarre. But anyway, big up Taylor Lorenz. We move on. Um, phones are confiscated upon admittance and audience members are subjugated to compulsory face scans. The mothership has hosted come some of the comedy's most controversial figures. Roseanne, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, during last week's episode with Joe Rogan Experience, um, Rogan complained to Paulie Shaw, which is funny, right? The the son of Mitzi, um, who obviously ran the flipping comedy store with all these guys flipping, you know, wank over. During last week's episode of the Rogan Experience, Rogan complained to Paulie Shaw, the son of legendary com comedy store founders and himself a mothership performer. Um, the owning and operating of a club that caters to fringe comics isn't always a walk in the park. The quote, I would always tell people, be nice to comedy club owners because you don't want to be one. Clearly, Joe Rogan lamented, saying that the wrangling of his lineups has been the biggest stressor of his club owner career during um, dealing with green room full of Joe Rogan's may no longer be Joe Rogan's dream job. And I think I said this before when I when I did a live stream that I was curious before the club actually opened. I think I said a few times I was wondering who was going to actually run the club day to day. Was Rogan going to do it? Because I feel like a lot of these podcast guys, I don't know what it is about them, but whenever they get into deals that have to do with managing people, they just assume they're going to be the manager. Very rarely do you see um, a podcaster who has like a network, who has like a podcast that gets signed um, and maybe they have to hire more staff. 
who's going to open a studio. Very rarely do you see these people take the money from whatever partnership they're going to be, you know, whoever's partnering up with them and then say, hey, I'm going to invest this and hire somebody to do the day-to-day -day managing. Because I think it's one thing doing something out of your little studio with your three friends. But then if you're scaling it up, I think it's probably for the best that you get somebody else involved. Like somebody like, quote unquote, a third party, some an external source to come in and kind of be able to manage a team and be able to manage it from a quasi-professional way so that the bl the lines between business and personal don't get blurred. That might be a good way to go about things, but everyone has to kind of do it themselves. They just assume because they're good podcasters, they're going to be good business people or good managers of people, which is not always a fact. And I thought, you know, day to day, if the club's going to be open, what, Monday to Sunday? I don't know if it's open every single day of the week, but, you know, let's, let's say five days a week. That's a lot of work to be managing a place like that, you know, when you've never done it before. Um, you know, he's rich and stuff, but it doesn't mean he's got experience doing all that stuff. And then I think in the first few weeks, it seemed like he had his, you know, he was really there and kind of hands on. But then I've heard from a few times, a few comics. I think I heard Eric Griffin say it once already that when he went to perform that weekend, Rogan wasn't even there. So it looks like maybe he's tired to take a bit of a step back now and let whoever's managing the comedy mothership manage it. And then he, I guess, is the overseer. Obviously, he fucking he owns it, so he can do what he wants. But the day-to-day -day managing of it must be a bit of a bore. Not a bore, it must be super, super stressful. I can imagine, especially on top of what, everything else he does. USC, the podcast, anything else he does on the side. That's a lot. The family, day-to-day, like -day, it's a lot of work, man. Like you're just adding unnecessary stress that you don't need to be adding to your life. Essentially, you're giving yourself a nine to five. <laughs> you know, Rogan, you know, made his entire career trying to get out of the rat race. Right. He's somebody that clearly hates desk jobs. Like anytime he talks about desk jobs and office jobs and how destructive they are, you know, the Joe Rogan subreddit explodes. People hate that when he starts speaking down upon people working regular jobs. He thinks everyone should have like a business, you know, making knives and flipping wooden furniture and shit. He doesn't understand why you you wouldn't go what wouldn't chase after your dreams. So I can't so it's just funny that now the same guy that was moaning and saying that, you know, office jobs are shit and they're cancerous is now the same person who's legitimately given himself a nine to five on purpose. But now he's realizing it's not as crashed up to be. It continues here. It said, I I had like I had a, like a talk to myself about it. Like, God damn, you really want to take this on? Rogan said, or the realization that the nightly stresses in simply getting these chosen anti work comics on stage will be a part and parcel of the mothership experience. This is the funny bit, right? You don't want to be some person hoping that this guy shows up and that he's, he was not doing coke last night and that he's not on a two-day bender. He missed his flights or didn't sleep, it, Rogan admitted. This is why, for me, I can never take seriously this whole narrative that all these guys, I say narrative because Brendan says it the way like that. It's not because I can't say flipping narrative. But the whole narrative around these comedians where they think that they're the hardest workers in the world when most of them don't you know work at all. They do the bare minimum. And most of them go on stage telling the same tired jokes. It's not like they're at home crafting a new bit, crafting a new hour, you know, slaving over their previous jokes and making edits, whatever they may be. No, they just do the same thing that worked before, tune it and then kind of repeat it again. They try and do the bare minimum and get the most results. So when they hold kind of flung this whole, we work hard, we work hard thing, not really. And also if you do something that you enjoy, it's not really hard work anyway, because you're doing it because you enjoy to do it. So that's by the by. And obviously it pays well as well, because these guys, you know, if it wasn't paying well to podcast or to do stand up, they wouldn't do it. There is, you know, there's very, I can't think of many stand ups in that scene, apart from maybe, I don't know, the Doug Stanhopes, I'll just think of it just now, who are literally in it for the art of making people laugh. Like he would legitimately be doing it in a bar somewhere. Most of these guys, if stand-up didn't pay, they wouldn't be doing it. The funny thing that I that makes me laugh about is, is that, right? So I can never take them seriously about working hard. The other thing that's really hilarious about it is that this just shows you how inherently lazy stand-up comedians are. From from what we've been able to pass so far, from what we've been able to be gleaned, you know, it's not a lot of details, but everything's a bit hush hushy. But you know, comics, they love to fucking talk. They love, you know, if they complain about people like myself doing streams and shit comics are the worst right they can't keep secrets they love to gossip so we just hear little bits from the bits that we've heard so far about rogan's club it's incredibly well organized it's one of the best clubs in the world in terms of facilities and shit the sound audio visual all the little details people creaming themselves over the little store they put behind the curtains so that you can gather your thoughts the green room is sick you get anything you need there's no flipping hangers on in the back in the green room everything's just done you know top of top 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 of the line Another thing we've heard is that it pays well. 
allegedly Rogan pays really well. We don't know what the rate is, how he judges it, but people are saying that he pays extremely well to the point where people are saying that some people are getting overpaid, <laughs> right? That's what kind of vibe that he's on. And obviously he's Joe Rogan and it's Joe Rogan's comedy club. It's going to end up being probably rated one of the best comedy clubs in the world, right? Soon, if it's not already on the way. And you imagine all the clout you get from performing there. All those things in mind, these fucking comedians are still lazy enough to sometimes not show up to a gig and to sometimes go on flipping benders before they go go and do one. Imagine that. Imagine you're a stand-up comedian. You have Joe Rogan's sort of like friendship in your pocket or your friends with him just in general, you get along to the point where he likes you. He might invite you on a pod. He thinks you're funny. He might book you at his club and you don't turn up on time. <laughs> you don't turn up on time right <laughs> or if you do turn up you're high you're just on the you're on a fucking um you're on a come down from a two-day bender or something just imagine that shows you everything that's inherently wrong with most of these stand-ups out there who try, and again it's, it's 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 fairly okay if they had this you know this kind of like um this sort of like laissez-faire quasi rock star sort of persona where they're like you know what this is what we do right we're comics, we live this sort of life on the edge, blah, blah, blah. But it's most of these guys with podcasts, they like to make it seem that because they do a pod or because they make some content online, that it somehow constitutes as them like working on a building site. It's just bizarre that they think like creating content and most of these guys aren't editing it. They aren't clipping it up themselves. They don't design flyers. They don't design thumbnails. They're not editing anything like zero. They're just sitting in front of a camera. Someone's doing everything else for them and they think it's the hardest job in the world. Well, the easiest job in the world, I think, is doing that shit, especially if you're really good at it. It should become an autopilot and they still can't do it. They still fuck it up. So I thought that was a hilarious insight that people are legitimately, you know, flaking on their set at flipping um, Rogan's. Crazy. It continues. Rogan revealed that these um, past couple of months of comedy club ownership have made him sympathetic to the gatekeepers at whom he farmed his nose at when the comedy store first opened. Rogan said, there are so many factors dealing with your livelihood if you're a club owner. People get too drunk, they're crazy, they do stuff, they do this, they do that, they wreck the hotel room and you're constantly like putting out fires. Imagine. So he, so from what I've obviously been gleaning as well, I think this is a standard thing. He invites people down and then I guess he's got some sort of deal with a local hotel. Um, and essentially, you just a plug and play. They got everything set up for you. So you just turn up there as a comedian. They already have the openers for you who are in-house. They're going to bring in. They set you up a place to stay. And, you know, you do, you, you kind of get your freak on. So people are doing this. They're turning up late. They're turning up drunk. They're turning up high. They're going to come down. And they're also trashing hotel rooms at Rogan's, you know, club is flipping booking for them. You couldn't make this up. It continues. At the start of the comedy motion's opening night back in March, Rogan celebrated this christening of the Pirate Radio Playhouse by loudly declaring, I'm drunk and the mushrooms are in my club. This is the highest I've ever been on stage. Now there's nothing that stresses Rogan out more than the comics showing up for a set, the same, the same set that he was opening night. Two months later, the hangover finally hit him. So the day-to-day -day haggles of running a club is not all it's cracked up to be. Color me surprised. But also, it's just hilarious to see that most of these guys are as lazy as we imagined they would be. Most of them. Especially the ones who have been given every advantage under the sun. They're as lazy as each other, essentially. Which also explains why the ones that become successful so quickly do become successful so quickly. Because if you're able to put in a, a minute level of effort above what the regular person does, you're going to get pretty far. If you can legitimately write as much as possible, legitimately be open to criticism, legitimately, you know, um, take notes from other comics or whatnot and be okay with it. Um, maybe put out some content that maybe doesn't go well, but just for the sake of flipping market research, go into as many spots as possible, blah, -de blah, blah, blah. You'll probably get really far. Obviously, you've got to be really funny. You've got to have a good stage presence, blah. We know all that stuff. But if you just insert a trink link, a little flipping salt-based sprinkle of hard work, you're going to get far so far in this game because the majority of these guys are lazy as fuck lazy as fuck and that obviously has been proven by that article i would say when i read it i was like what people are turning up <laughs> late or missing or flaking on their set at the cody mothership you got brendan over there crying just sitting by the phone hoping daddy rogan calls him and then you got these other guys just not showing up 
or showing up drunk and high and stuff. Like, God damn it, man. This is annoying, get it? It's a 